All right, everyone, welcome to the second of these Arston Morse lectures. The, these lectures started in 1977, the first, which was the year Morse died. And the first lecture was Charlie Pfefferman, and followed by Raoul Bott and William Thurston. And next year uh, is the 100 year anniversary of Morse's paper on critical points of functions in um, many variables, which is founding what we now well, more theory. And so we're hoping next year to have a kind of special uh, edition of these lectures to look at the legacy of that paper. Okay, so with that said, I'm very pleased to welcome back Simon Brendo, who will tell us today about singularity models in 3D Ricci flow. <clears throat> thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, Today's lecture will be on geometric flows, and this has evolved into a large subject in differential geometry, and the basic idea is that we want to start with some geometric object and then evolve it by a heat equation, and then hopefully deform it to something similar to a canonical geometry. Now, th th there are many different um, different versions of this, where, where we can, can consider different geometric objects. So the simplest case is the um, case when the object in question is both in the plane, and then we're looking at what's called the curve shortening flow. Then an extension of that is the mean curvature flow, where we evolve submanifolds in Euclidean space, and we can more generally evolve any submanifold in a Riemannian Manifold. And then finally, the most important of all these evolution questions is the Ricci flow, where we evolve a Riemannian metric. So today I want to focus on the last um, evolution question, the Ricci flow. And so let me just digress maybe for a few minutes and remind you of the background, what a Riemannian metric is and what the meaning of curvature is. So, so we're going to assume that M is an n-dimensional manifold. And let's say we, we look at a local coordinate chart near some point. And so then x1 to xn are the coordinate functions. And so with that understood, a Riemannian metric, this, this is a, a symmetric tensor field, Gij. And locally, you can think of Gij as a function that takes values in the space of symmetric and positive definite matrices. Now, the, the geometric content of this is that a Riemannian metric gives us a way of measuring lengths of tangent vectors to M. It gives us a way of measuring lengths of curves, and then it allows us to measure distances between points. And so here's how this would work. So let's say we have a parameterized curve alpha of s, then we can look at the length and to compute the length, we just integrate the norm of the tension vector alpha dot and the norm is computed with respect to this metric tensor gij. So gij tells you how to compute the length of this tangent vector alpha dot, and then you use the metric gij at a point alpha. And of course, you, you can set it up in a coordinate invariant way. And then um, if you have two different coordinate systems, then th there's a way of transforming the metric from one coordinate chart to another. Yeah, um, the simplest case is when you have the Euclidean space and then gij is constant in x and equals delta ij. And so then once you know how to co compute lengths of curves, then you can also talk about distances between points because you can minimize the length among all curves joining two points. Okay, so, so what, is, what is the meaning of curvature? So, as I mentioned, you can deform the metric as you pass from one coordinate system to another. And so you can have a coordinate, you can have a metric that is actually the Euclidean metric, even though it doesn't look like it, because you have transformed to a, a non-standard coordinate system. 
And so curvature allows you to detect whether a given metric is a Euclidean metric in disguise. And so, so it turns out that the, um, the curvature of a metric, this is given by a tensor with four indices, R, I, J, K, L. And the expression is rather complicated, but you can think of it in this way. You can break it up into a leading term um, which involves second order derivatives of the metric, and it's linear in these second order derivatives. And you can write them down quite easily. And you can also see that this expression has certain symmetries. So, for example, if you switch I and J, this changes sign. And if you switch K and L, it changes sign. And if you interchange the block IJ with the block KL, then it doesn't change anything. So this is the leading part. It's linear in the second derivatives. And then there's a, an extra term that I will not write, but this is quadratic in the first derivatives with coefficients that depend on the metric tensor itself. And so, so this is a nonlinear expression, and it has to be nonlinear because we want this to transform nicely under changes of coordinates. So th this is the whole point. So in other words, if you have any metric tensor and you can convert it by a change of coordinates to the standard Euclidean metric, then this Rijkl vanishes identically. Conversely, if this vanishes in a neighborhood, then locally you can perform a change of coordinates to make the metric um, look like the standard Euclidean metric, so that Gij is delta Ij. So to summarize, this is really the obstruction um, for the existence of such a coordinate system. And then basically the form of the quadratic terms, this is dictated by the transformation law that you want under changes of coordinates. Now, the, the Riemann curvature tends to, this is the most basic object, and this encodes all the information, but it's also quite complicated algebraically. And um, so that there's a rough analogy where you can compare the Riemann tensor of a metric with the Hessian of a function. And so then you can contract. And so just as the trace of the Hessian of a function gives you the Laplacian in the same way, the trace of the Riemann curvature tensor gives you what is called the Ricci tensor. So what you do here is you take the Riemann tensor and you contract the second and fourth index and you use the metric to contract it. And so here this G upper KL, this is defined as the inverse of G lower KL. And so this is the right coordinate uh, in the, uh, independent, invariant way um, to take a contraction. And then this gives you a symmetric tensor with two indices and that's called the Ricci tensor. And then if you contract again, that gives you a function and that's called the scalar curvature. So the thing to keep in mind is um, these objects, they're much easier to handle algebraically, but they also contain much less information. They only contain information about averages of curvature. Now, um, the tensor minus to Ricci, this is the this can be viewed as the Laplacian of the metric. And this Ricci tensor displays a very important role. In particular, it comes up in the Einstein equations in relativity. So the relativity, you would assume that G is a Lorentzian metric. So it would not be positive definite, but it would be of signature one. Um, one, one n, and then um, the Einstein equations would take the form Ricci equal to zero. So this is a very natural object. Now, um, in 1982, Hamilton introduced this evolution equation for a Riemannian metric. So the idea is we want to start from an, a given initial metric, and then we, we want to evolve it to improve its properties. And so the idea is we want a heat flow, and well, minus twice the Ricci, this is 
the natural analog of the Laplacian of the metric, and so then the natural heat flow for a metric is this equation where the P of the metric equals minus twice the Ricci curvature. Of course, this is nonlinear because the Ricci curvature is a highly nonlinear expression in the metric. And so, so the way you should look at this is um, so the Einstein equation is Ricci equal to zero. So the Riemannian Einstein equation, that's sort of the analog, the nonlinear analog of the Laplace equation. The Lorentzian Einstein equation is a nonlinear analog of the wave equation. And this is a nonlinear analog of the heat equation. So let me give you some pictorial examples of how this evolution equation behaves. So if you have positive Ricci curvature, then distances shrink under the evolution. And so the simplest example would be um, a round sphere of dimension at least two. And then that would just shrink homothetically and it would collapse to a point in finite time. Now the, the Ricci flow is this respects a product structure. So if you look at a product um, as n goes with a line, then you get a cylinder and a cylinder of dimension at least three, um, that would still shrink homothetically under the Ricci flow and it would collapse to a line in finite time. So basically the cross section would evolve by Ricci flow one dimension lower and then the cross section collapses. Now, the important thing here is that the dimension is at least three, because if the cylinder is two-dimensional, then the cross-section is one-dimensional, and a one-dimensional sphere has no curvature, so, so then um, it wouldn't shrink at all under Ricci flow. Let me give you more examples. So the, 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 there's the cigar soliton, which is given as a conformal metric on R2, and the conformal factor is quite simple. It's just one over norm x squared. And so this metric, geometrically, um, it's a metric of positive curvature, which is asymptotic to a cylinder at infinity. So as you go out to infinity, the cross-section has asymptotically constant radius. So, and so, the, so this thing is asymptotic to a cylinder and it's rotationally symmetric. And it has the very remarkable property that it moves by diffeomorphisms when you evolve it by the Ricci flow. So if you take this thing and this metric and you evolve it by the Ricci flow, the metric at time t will be a reparameterization of the metric at time zero. So it will not be literally the same and because this metric is not flat, so the metric obviously changes, but it only changes by reparameterization, so that all the geometric features that are coordinate invariant, they will not change under the evolution. So, 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 so this is a, a special case of a self-similar solution. Now, there's a 3D analog of this. This was found by Robert Bryan many years ago. And this has the same property that under the Ricci flow, it moves by diffeomorphisms. So it just moves um, in a self-similar fashion where the solution gets reparameterized. It's again positively curved. It's again rotationally symmetric. But a crucial difference is that this one has different asymptotic behavior at infinity. So the radius at distance s for s large doesn't approach a constant, but rather it grows like the square root of the distance asymptotically. Um, so this means this opens up like a paraboloid roughly. And so this has to do with the fact that S2 has positive curvature, whereas S1 has zero curvature. So the, the behavior is quite different. Now, I mentioned before that you should really think of the Ricci flow as a heat equation. And one way to make that rigorous is by looking at the evolution of curvature. So if we look at the Riemann curvature tensor at any time, then we get a tensor field that changes in time. 
And if you take the time derivative of Rijkl, what you get is a Laplacian term, where the Laplacian is taken with respect to the time dependent metric. And then you get a quadratic polynomial in the Riemann curvature tensor. So it's a fairly um, simple equation. However, this Q of R term, this is quite complicated algebraically. And to this day, even though the formula has been around for, for almost 40 years, this is still only partially understood. So, so we know some of the algebraic properties, but, we, but this term is still quite mysterious in some respects, even it's uh, I mean, it has to do with the Lie algebra of SON, and it's it's still not quite understood. Right, so, so if you accept the premise that it, this is a heat equation, then um, you expect short time existence and uniqueness. And indeed, this is true and was proved again by Hamilton back in his fundamental paper in 1982. And what he showed is that if you have a compact manifold M and any given initial metric G0, then there exists a solution to the Ricci flow, which is defined on some maximal time interval, where this time um, capital T is strictly positive. Now, capital T can be finite or infinite, but if it is finite, then the curvature must be unbounded. So the only way a solution can cease to exist in finite time is when the curvature blows up. Now, the main goal is to understand um, singularity formation. In other words, we want to understand what happens when the curvature blows up. Now, one point that I would like to emphasize here is that often in PDE, we try to show that solutions exist for all time. We want to show that there are no singularities, and that is viewed as sort of the ideal. Now, here, first of all, um, in, in many case, interesting cases, you do get finite time blow up, and so expecting infinite time, expecting long time existence is just too, like, it's just not realistic, it's just not true in many interesting cases. And also, I would, the argument I would make is that it's even more interesting to have singularities, because it turns out that um, the flow, if it becomes singular, it can only become singular in sort of in a very specific way. So if a singularity happens, then at least in low dimensions, in dimension three, the singularity must show a very specific behavior. And so the point of view one can take is that as the solution evolves, we don't really understand the, the regions where the curvature is bounded. But then if the curvature blows up, we understand very well what happens in those cases. So for example, in Perelman's proof of the Poincaré conjecture, what he really proves is that if you had a counterexample to the Poincaré conjecture, then eventually the curvature becomes infinite at every point, and then you can understand the behavior of the flow everywhere because the curvature blows up everywhere. So curvature blow up is not really something undesirable, but it's a fact of life. And it's something very interesting that can tell you a lot about the manifold. When you say curvature unbounded, it is never using the metric of time t. Pardon me? When you say the curvature yes. unbounded, never it is the metric of time t yes. or time zero. Um, always with respect to the metric at time t. So, so we have the initial metric, but from that point on, all the geometric quantities are with respect to the evolving metric. Now, let me give you two examples um, in low dim of results in low dimensions. So the first one, well, this is actually not historically the first one, but this is the one in the, in the lowest dimension. So this says that if you have a metric on S2, any metric no restrictions, then the Ricci flow exists up to some finite time. You can compute exactly what the time is. It's proportional to the initial area. And then as you approach that time, the manifold collapses to a point, the curvature becomes very large. And if you rescale the metric 
sort of to unit size, maybe to unit volume, then um, the metric becomes wrong. So the curvature becomes constant. So the curvature goes to infinity, but if you scale it down, then it becomes constant. And so this gives an alternative proof of the uniformization form. And then there's the famous result of Hamilton in dimension three, where Hamilton assumed that the initial metric has positive Ricci curvature, and then he could draw the same conclusion. The solution exists up to some finite time. And as you approach that uh, time, then the manifold collapses to a point. And if you dilate it, um, then in a suitable rescaling, then the solution becomes round. So you can produce a constant curvature metric, and that tells you exactly what the topology is. But here you need, for this, for Hamilton's argument to work, you need positive Ricci curvature. So then there are two directions you can go from there. You can either try to understand what happens in higher dimensions um, under suitable positivity conditions on curvature, or you can stay in 3D and try to understand what happens for general. Sorry, can you go back one slide? Uh, what was this initial condition in the 1989 paper? Any metric you say it has to yes. be positively curved? Does, you don't need positive curvature. Don't need. Any Metric oh, completely yeah. arbitrary. Right, um, so in 3D, let's look at the same problem when we have arbitrary initial data, no assumptions whatsoever. So then the story becomes much more complicated because you cannot expect the solution to converge to a constant curvature metric up to the scaling and the basic picture to have in mind is that of a neck pinch singularity. So imagine we have a connected sum of two S3s. So topologically, that's still an S3, but metrically, we want to think of it as these two spheres joined by a neck, and the neck is smaller on an S2 cross with an interval. So you can like cook up such a metric and make it occasionally symmetric. And so then what will happen is that under the flow, this neck will pinch off because you have an S2 here, um, which has lots of curvature because the radius of the neck is assumed to be very small. And so then, of course, you also have these three spheres, uh, but here the curvature is much smaller. And so the curvature in the neck will blow up before it blows, before the curvature blows up sort of in the S3 regions. And so then the picture you get looks like this, where the neck pinches off and the curvature blows up here, but it, it doesn't blow up everywhere at the same time. And so then, um, Shortly before the singularity, what you would see is, is a small piece of the cylinder with high curvature. Another possibility is you, you can form a degenerate neck pinch, and that one would be modeled under Brian Soliton, the self similar solution that I showed you earlier. Now, in 2002, Perlman achieved a series of breakthroughs in the understanding of. Ricci flow, particularly in the 3D case. And his first big breakthrough was the non collapsing form, which actually holds in all dimensions. So, as the non collapsing form tell you, so a solution to the Ricci flow, this is called Kappa non collapse. If an upper bound on the curvature in a ball gives you a lower bound on the volume. And so here, these condition, this condition, both the assumption and the conclusion, they're formulated in a scaling invariant way. So the, the, the curvature scales like the radius to the power negative two. And so then if the norm of curvature is bounded by the radius to the negative two, then we want to say that the volume of the ball is greater than um, a constant kappa times r to the n. And so, so what Perlman proved is that if you take a, consider a solution to the Ricci flow on a 
starting from any metric on a compact manifold. And if you look at a bounded time interval, so all this discussion is for a bounded time interval, then you get this non-collapsing property with a uniform constant kappa, and the constant depends on the initial data and the length of the time interval. And so then, because this property is scaling invariant, then this is inherited by any blow-up limit, by any singularity model. So let me give you a couple of examples. So we have seen some basic solutions that solve as possible singularity models. Now let's go through the list and see which ones are non-collapsed. So the shrinking spheres in dimension two or higher, they're non-collapsed. The shrinking cylinders are non-collapsed in dimension at least three, but collapsed in dimension two. The cigar silicon in 2D is collapsed, and you can see that, for example, from the fact that it is asymptotic to a 2D cylinder, which is collapsed, and the brine silicon is non-collapsed. And so what Perlman's non-collapsing from dust, among other things, it knocks off these collapsed singularity models, and it, it tells you that these hypothetical singularity models cannot actually occur. So basically, then in dimension at least three, you, you, have, um, you have shrinking spheres, you have cylinders, and then you have the, this brine soliton. Now, Perlman, in the 3D case, achieved a qualitative understanding of what singularity formation looks like. And the key concept in his theory is the concept of an ancient solution. So this concept actually goes back to Hamilton and an ancient solution. This is simply a solution that's defined infinitely far backwards in time. So it's defined on an interval from negative infinity up to T. And then it, it could be defined going forward beyond capital T could be defined all the way up to time plus infinity. We don't really care. What we care about is that it has an infinitely long back history. Now, ancient solutions to parabolic PDE, they're really the analog of entire solutions to elliptic PDEs. And so just as when you study singularities and blow-up limits of solutions of elliptic PDEs, you, you usually get entire solutions. In the same way, if you study parabolic PDE, the singularity models naturally are ancient solutions. Of course, a big question is if you can, at a singularity, if you can even take a limit. But Perlman showed that in 3D you can. And so he showed that if you start with any given initial metric and you focus on a finite time interval, then at any point where the curvature is large, the solution can be approximated to any desired degree of accuracy by a model solution. And this model solution, this is an ancient solution, which is also non-collapsed and satisfies certain extra conditions. For example, in 3D, it has no negative curvature. Sorry, when you say the solution can be approximated, you mean even as it approaches the singularity? That's correct. So, so, so we, we look at a point shortly before the singularity. At that point, the curvature is still finite, but very large. And then we're saying that in, an, in, in a neighborhood of this solution, you can approximate it by a model solution. And the model solution, this says, um, this is ancient. It's non-collapsed because of Perlman's non-collapsing theorem, and it has no negative curvature because of the theorem of Hamilton. And the approximation gets better and better the higher the level of curvature is. So the closer you get to the actual singularity, the better the approximation gets. All right, and so, so this is the first part of Perlman's understanding of singularities. So singularities are modeled on these ancient kappa solutions. Now, the second insight is that you can understand, by Perlman, is that you can understand. Sorry, what, 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 what is kappa? Kappa is a uniform. So th this is the non-collapsing constant, and you get it from the initial data. So the initial data, depending on the initial data, you can conclude that 
all the blow-up limits are non-collapse. And then that gives you this constant. Now, actually, once you have any constant, then it turns out, again, by work of Perlman, that then the kappa is independent of the initial data that he um, that generated the singularity. So, so it's, you can actually choose it to be universal. And this will come up later. All right, now let me tell you about the qualitative properties of ancient solutions. So singularities are modeled on ancient solutions, and then ancient solutions have a particular behavior. And let me tell you what it is. So to that end, I have to tell you a precise definition of a neck. So an epsilon neck, this is a region in a manifold, which after some rescaling is epsilon close in a very good norm to a metric product of a round S2 with a long interval. So what's important here is that you have, an, you have the standard S2 of radius one, and then you take a product with a very long interval, and then an epsilon neck would be a region, which is basically a small perturbation of this product geometry. All right, and so, so now here's Perlman structure form. So let's assume we have an ancient kappa solution, then it's either compact or non-compact. But the interesting case, the, the more important one is the non-compact case. And in that case, um, well, either this solution is a family of shrinking cylinders or quotients. So then you know exactly what the geometry is. It's, it's a metric product and the cross-section is round. Or if that doesn't happen, then this MGT has the structure of an infinitely long tube with a cap attached on one side. And so, so the picture would be that you have this tube. You don't really know how it opens up, but what you do know is that every point on this tube lies on an epsilon neck. So it's like, so, so think of it this way, you have maybe here a neck. See? A point that lies at the center of such a neck, and then you have another overlapping neck um, that's, that continues. And so, so, you, so you have basically this tube, which is made up by overlapping necks. And so you understand extremely well the geometry of this tube. Now, if it doesn't split as a product, then on one side, there's a cap attached. And Perlman doesn't really prove what his cap, anything about what his cap looks like, but he shows that it's diffeomorphic to a disk, so you understand the topology, and then it has controlled geometry after the scaling. So if you scale it by, so there exists a scaling such that after this rescaling, the maximum of the maximum curvature is at most C of epsilon. The minimum coverage is at most one over C of epsilon, and the diameter is at most C of epsilon. What kind of curvature, Ricci, or you can so they're all comparable to each other. In three dimensions, so you can take in three D. So the biggest. Oh, you're right. I forgot we in three D. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can. So the smallest sectional curvature is bounded from below, and the largest one is bounded from above. But an interesting point about this term is sort of, it depends on this parameter epsilon. So if you choose epsilon, you can choose it as small as you like, but the smaller you choose it, the more picky you are about your necks. And then the, the cap is basically the region of all points that are not an epsilon neck. And so you're very, the more picky you are about the definition of your neck, the larger the region you have to exclude. And so then the larger the cap region would be. And then, and that's why all these constants depend on epsilon. So the exceptional region would get larger and its diameter would get bigger. And the, the, all the quantitative estimates would get worse if you make epsilon smaller. In this game, so do rescaling, but do you do repair matrices and also? Yes, so you would put yourself at some point on the neck, and then you can say that around that point, if you choose the right parameter, so around that point, if you scale correctly, you get bounds for the curvature from above and below, you get bounds for this 
distance, you get bounds for all the derivatives. And then you can argue in the right coordinate system, then you control the geometry. Okay, so this gives a complete qualitative picture of what singularities look like. So any, so all the high curvature regions, they basically look like necks or caps. And Perlman doesn't really need to for his applications to, to the Poincaré and geometrization conjecture. He doesn't need to understand the cap region because eventually, um, what he does is he follows the neck out and he does search, a, a kind of surgery procedure on the neck and then the, the cap part is discarded. And so as long as you understand the topology, you don't, really, you don't need to understand what the cap looks like. Mentally. Maybe say a philosophical word about the geometrization when you would have to get one of these geometries in that process, how he gets into Thurston's classification. So this is related to the infinite time behavior. So for Poincaré, you look at finite times, and then in the infinite time setting, if you know the flow exists forever, then you can you, you, you can show that you have a thick thin decomposition, and then you use ideas from topology. So it combines Ricci flow with other things. All right, and so then what Perlman does for Poincaré is he has the surgery procedure where he can, if the curvature blows up at one point, but not at other points, he can sort of separate the regions, the high curvature regions from the low curvature regions by surgery, cut out the high curvature regions, and he can continue. Now today, I don't want to go into the details of that, but instead, I want to come back to the behavior of this, these ancient solutions. So Perlman has this qualitative picture, but he made a conjecture that actually there should be only, very, only a certain number of examples. And so there are a couple of obvious examples, so the shrinking cylinders, then you can take quotients. And then among the non-compact ones, there's the Brian soliton and Perlman conjecture that these are the only ones. And so on the Brian soliton, even though it opens up like a propyloid, you have exactly the structure that if you go far enough out, then you have this neck picture, this neck structure. And when so- When you non-compact, we assume complete? That's right. So all these metrics are completed. The reason being that if you come from a compact manifold and you dilate, then the limit will still be complete, but it may not be compact. But proving completeness is, is, is actually a, 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 one of the hard parts in Perlman's theory, because you want to pass to a limit, but then you need to know that if you normalize your curvature at one point to be one by scaling, you need to know that you can go out arbitrarily far and you still have a curvature bound. And this is called the long range curvature estimate. And in my view, this is one of Perlman's most remarkable and technically most difficult insights. One of many problems. Is it clear that complete will be preserved by the evolution? So complete, if you start with complete and bounded curvature, that's preserved. But here, you, you wouldn't take the complete metric and evolve it, but you would construct the whole flow in the limit from the, as a limit of the original one. So you have this compact flow, and then you would take a limit and you would extract this limit. But proving that a limit exists and is complete, that's, one of, that's a very hard step in the program. All right, so the term I proved a few years ago is that Perlman's conjecture is actually true. And you really only, that, and, and indeed, you only get these very specific examples. <laughs> and so this is, and so, so this is related to an earlier result on mean curvature flow that I proved with Kyung Su Choi, also from Columbia back in 2017. And the, the Ricci flow 
oh, you mean this is inspired by the one on mean curvature flow, but th there's a major difference. So for mean curvature flow, there are many more techni many techniques that don't have a counterpart for the Ricci flow. So between the two, the Ricci flow is always the harder one. And there's some major additional obstacles in the Ricci flow case. Now, if you combine this with Perlman's, well, then it tells you exactly what the solution, what the singularities in 3D look like, because they're modeled on ancient solutions. And so then we know exactly what the ancient Kappa solutions are. And so then the only singularity models are basically spheres and cylinders and the brine and the quotients plus the brine soliton. Now, let me tell you about these, some of the ideas going into the proof. So the, the proof roughly breaks up into two parts. And the first step is to understand ancient Kappa solutions with rotational symmetry. And so in the rotationally symmetric setting, everything simplifies considerably because then you can reduce the problem to a heat equation for a single function in one space variable, whereas in general, Ricci flow is a system. And of course, you have um, in 3D you have three space variables. But one, hard, one aspect that makes Ricci flow difficult is that it's a system. But this goes away in the rotational least case, and you can boil it down to this um, nonlinear heat equation for this for a single function u. And so then for that function, you can use maximum principles and barrier arguments. And in particular, we need to, I mean, we need to establish precise asymptotic estimates. And so then if you understand the asymptotics sufficiently well, the asymptotics for t going to minus infinity and the asymptotics as you go out to infinity at a given point in time, then with some effort, you can show that the Brian soliton is the only example that's the only example of an ancient Kappa solution in this class. Now, the second step, and this is the main difficulty, this is to show that every non-compact ancient Kappa solution is in fact rotationally symmetric. And so this step interestingly uses the classification of rotationally symmetric solutions from the first step. So you have to do it in this order. And so, so the interesting thing is that understanding the rotationally symmetric solutions sufficiently well makes it easier to show that an arbitrary solution that a priori might not necessarily be rotationally symmetric is actually rotationally symmetric. Then another ingredient that goes into this is an, a classification that I did earlier of uh, self-similar solutions. So it's so, so basically as you take an ancient solution, you can extract a limit that gives you a self-similar solution. And these limits I was able to classify earlier. And so then that tells you that at some points in time, the cap is nearly rotationally symmetric, but it's only true along a select sequence of times going to minus infinity. And so roughly speaking, the idea is you find some sequence of times where the solution is nearly rotationally symmetric. And this is possible by the um, classification of self-similar solutions with, um, from my earlier work. And then a crucial ingredient is what I call the neck improvement, though, which tells you that the symmetry gets better under the evolution. And so then the idea is you can go very far back in time. You can find times um, where the solution is highly symmetric. And then you show that as you go forward in the evolution, the symmetry doesn't get worse. And you can argue sort of that as long as the, the, the symmetry is good, you're close to a Brian soliton. And as long as you stay close to a Brian soliton, the symmetry gets better. And then if the symmetry gets better, that means you stay close to a Brian soliton. And then the symmetry is never lost. And 
so, so the, this is the, the rough idea. So the, the main th ingredient is basically the classification of solutions with rotational symmetry that O'Brien soliton is the only example in the class of solutions with rotational symmetry, then the classification of self-similar solutions, and then a crucial, and then the other crucial ingredient is the symmetry involvement. Right, um, since, so, so let me not go into details here, but let, let me instead come back to the implications for singularity formation. So if you put everything together, Perlman's work, um, on singularity formation together with the classification of ancient Kappa solutions, you get this corollary that if you have a solution to the Ricci flow on a compact three manifold, which exists up to some finite time t and goes singular at that point, then near each point where the curvature is large, you can approximate a solution up to any desired degree of accuracy by one of these three models. You can see a round sphere or a quotient of a round sphere. So for example, you can see a lens space. Then you could see the cylinder S2 cross R, or you could see um, RP2 cross R, maybe if you're um, if the manifold is non-orientable. There are also other quotients of S2 cross <laughs> Are, and then you can see O'Brien soliton. And so these are the only possibilities. And furthermore, we know from um, an analysis of the rotationally symmetric case that all these models do in fact occur. So the round sphere, that's obvious, we already saw that. Then the cylinder corresponds to a neck pinch and the Brian soliton, this arises in a degenerate neck pinch. So this is a complete list. Finally, um, let me tell you about a companion result in the compact case. Um, in terms of the understanding singularity formation, the compact ancient solution are, are the ones that really matter. So that they're also, so the non-compact ones are the ones that primarily matter. But you can also study compact ancient solutions. And they also play some role in singularity formation. Basically, if you have a solution um, where you have surgeries on the neck, then you could see a non you could see a compact ancient solution as you come out of a singularity on a after surgery. So, yeah, and so, so in this case, you can ask the problem, can you classify those? And the answer is that you can. And so the obvious examples are the shrinking spheres and the quotients. So shrinking round spheres and quotients of these. And apart from them, there are only two more. And so one is an, an ancient solution constructed by Perlman. And then, so th this one is rotationally symmetric and it also has a reflection symmetry. So maybe let me draw a picture for you of Perlman's compact ancient solution. So let me draw that for at some point t, which is close to minus infinity. So then it looks essentially like this. You have one piece that's approximately a Brian soliton. I mean, not, not exactly, but approximately. Then you have a kind of cylindrical region in the middle. And then you have another cap attached on the other side, which is also close to a Brian soliton. Right, so essentially in the compact case, um, you have a, a, the structure of a tube, but now you have two caps attached on either side. And Perlman showed that you can construct an example of such an ancient solution. And this one has rotational symmetry, and it also has a reflection symmetry, since the two pieces are identical. And so then when we showed together with Toti Descalopoulos and Natasha Sesum is that Perlman's compact ancient solution, that's the only 
the, the only compact ancient solution, only compact ancient kappa solution, I should say, um, that's the geomorphic to S3. And so then beyond this, there's only a C2 quotient of that, where you identify antipodal points. And then beyond that, you only get the shrinking space forms. And that, that's the complete list. And so, so like the Brine soliton, um, this is occasionally symmetric, but this one is not self-similar. So this solution constructed by Perlman, this is, so all these singularity models, all the ancient Kappa solutions, they're all occasionally symmetric and all except this one here are self-similar. This is the only one that's not self-similar. I mean, yes. Why don't you have also S2 terms? <laughs> Yes, so S2 cos S1, that would collapse. So, so then the, so what would happen? So if you take S2 cos S1, then what would happen is that the S2, um, in as you go back in time, the S1 would have a constant length, let's say one, and the S2, that would grow at a rate, so the radius would grow like a constant times t. Now, the reason you don't get that is because that would be collapsed as you go to minus infinity. So basically non-collapsing says that if you are at the, what we call the curvature scale, where the curvature is bounded on a ball of radius r by one over r squared, then the volume is at least r cubed times a constant. And so if you look at this one here, the curvature scale, that would be approximately one over negative t. But then the volume would be too small since the S1 doesn't grow. So that's why the, this doesn't appear in the classification. Now, if you take S2 cos S1 as your initial data and evolve it, what would happen is the S2 would collapse, the S1 would stay the same because there is no curvature. And then as you look at the singularity under the magnifying glass, well, you dilate it, and then the S2 after dilation would have radius one, but the S1 would get huge. And then you would see S2 cos R. So that, that's how, how it would come up in the classification. Okay, so I'll, I'll end here, thank you. Questions? So I have one technical question, one philosophical question. So the first question is how close, given all this understanding, are you to, I give you a manifold and I want to flow it to one of the geometries. Uh, suppose I want to implement it on a computer. Oh. <laughs> so that, yeah, yeah. You show me, you know, like SNAP-P does this with hyperbolic geometry. It, okay. It actually, you, you feed in some knot and it will always feed back with the hyperbolic geometry that unique that carry there. And since here you everything is proved that you get to these, uh, how close is I mean what, so you're studying the you clearly have a deep understanding of of, of the of this Ricci flow and at least this part of it. And then they only finitely many lower surgeries they do. That's correct. So can... how close is this to actually being algorithmic? Well, so, so first of all, I have no idea about the numerical side of things. And um, philosophically, I mean, is this something that could be, I mean, you could imagine the, the so you want to solve the heat equation. Yes. I mean, the elliptic equation, you could make a parabolic equation and it will, it will converge to, in the linear case, to the <laughs> solution to the elliptic equation. And it does so quite quickly, and I think maybe even numerically. That's, well, in the linear case, certainly, I mean, for Ricci flow, I mean, that's, so, so of course, the Ricci flow is an essential tool in proving that you can find one of these canonical geometries. But I mean, first of all, you have to do the surgeries, and then I think you may also have to cut a long tori. Yeah. And then the question, then there's the question, if eventually 
you converge to one of a lot of geometries. And I'm not even, I'm not sure that's known. I think Javlot proved it certainly in special cases, in many interesting special cases, but I don't know if it's, com if it's known in complete generality. I would have to check and get back to you. And my philosophical question is, say you want to do the Yamabi problem, which yes. you can do by Ricci flow, and you of course can do variationally. Can you give us now that you understand this big picture, when flow is going to be better than variational methods or vice versa, or are they always the same? Well, the, so first of all, the Yamabi problem is very different since you fix the conformal class. Right, right. So and it's in a function only. Yeah. So, so then it, the, the flow is just with a speed given by scalar curvature. Now, if you compare that to the variational approach, I think the difference is the minimization approach only sees the bottom end sort of level of the functional and as such it's much easier the flow you can start at any energy level and the yamabi functional is known in examples with many many critical points and so in that case the flow is much more subtle i think what is related to the flow the right analog i think is the um the theory that my good friend abbas Bari developed about um, critical points at infinity. And he was able to understand using variational techniques, these higher critical points. And I think that's, that has a connection to the heat flow. Now for Ricci flow, I think the variational interpretation is more complicated. I mean, if yeah, you right. want to look at it. Yeah. Even that there's a function that you gradient over it. You didn't highlight that. That's right. So, so Ricci flow is a gradient flow, but it, the story is complicated because the, the functional would be the Kalman W right. functional, and the gradient flow is not literally Ricci flow, but Ricci flow mod modified by diffeomorphisms, so that the self-similar solutions they would correspond to critical points. But I'm not aware of any kind of variational theory. So I would say. In this setting, I don't see any way you could do any okay, of Okay, I'll just tell you a little story that Hellman yeah, sure. said to me, he could do everything variationally. He did? Right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just by the way. <laughs> but I, I didn't ask him for details. Well, <laughs> in his paper, he used... Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I think he said I could translate everything back to variational. Is I'm just quoting what he said. Well, I mean, Kalman can do a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. But I think. I asked him exactly this question. He said, well, if you're desperate, I could do everything creation. But <laughs> I think the flow is very interesting in, no, no, in its no, own no, right. And I'm not, sure if a, I'm not sure if a variational approach would be feasible. I mean, even if, I mean, when you look at it, it, it the main, I mean, one of many key insights is his monotonicity. Yeah. And what would the analog of that be in the variational approach? Yeah, we can talk later. Yeah. <laughs> exactly what he told me. <laughs> yeah, so I have a, a big question, um, which might be naive. So are these, uh, let's call them kind of models or moduli spaces of, um, of um, similarities, are they in some way connected? Like, and if they are, can you say whether, you know, at some blow up point, you might in principle see like a unique singularity model or, or not? That's a good point. Um, so let's see. So first of all, regarding the connectedness, I mean, in 3D, we understand the whole space and it is connected because let's say in the non-compact case, you have the the brine solitant, and that can degenerate into a cylinder oh, as you go right. out. So, so, so I want... Could that even degenerate to the brine soliton if you kind of... Exactly. So, so uh, this one, as you make... So, so if you take limits of these around the tip, you get you the brine soliton. If you take limits around the center, you get the cylinder. So in that sense, I believe you could set it up in a way so that the moduli space is connected. Now, in higher dimensions, for in higher, unless you impose additional curvature assumptions, you, you don't get such a neat picture. And the problem is that all, like, for example, this long range curvature estimate by Perelman, that uses in an essential way, Perelman, excuse me, Hamilton's 
pinching estimate in 3D. So a lot of this theory works in 3D, but in higher dimensions for general initial data. So in higher dimensions, I don't even, uh, we can't even prove convergence to a singularity model unless you start with a, an, in a, an assumption regarding positivity of curvature. Now, as to your second question about uniqueness of like blow up limits, um, I think that there are two different types of limits you can take. And like in minimal surface theory, you can blow up around a fixed base point in ambient space, and then you get a cone, or you can blow up along a sequence of points. And so here, these types of blow ups are the more general type where you allow an arbitrary sequence. If you're looking for the analog of a cone, then there's a, a procedure where you can sort of fix a base point and then take a blow up, and then you would see a self-similar shrinking solution, which is the analog of a cone. And, and would, you, would you know that that is unique or? So in 3D, I think it's almost, I think it has to be unique because there's so few examples. I mean, it essentially can only be a cylinder or like a, a sphere. But I think in higher dimensions, as you get more interesting examples of self-similar shrinking solutions, I think that would be a really interesting. Ah, so if you fix the point, actually the space of possible limits becomes disconnected, essentially, that's what you're saying. Right, so, so what I'm saying is if you fix the point, then the analog of a cone for Ricci flow would be a self-similar shrinking solution. And in 3D, there are so few of these that I think uniqueness, at least depends on how you interpret it. But in some sense, it's, it's that we know uniqueness. But in higher dimensions, as you have more examples, then I think it, it's largely an open question. So in particular, the, the, the Brian Soliton you can actually get only if you take a sequence of different points on which you're rescaling. You're That's correct. So that. like, like in sort of picture, for example, it with a degenerate neck pinch would be, let me draw it here on the other bottom, is that you have a singularity that's smaller than the Brian Soliton, but then the tip moves very fast. So if you fix, so let me draw the corresponding picture for me in the curvature flow. The, the, then the analog is the old silicon, and this now lives in R3. So for me in curvature flow, it's easier to draw. And so then if you fix an, a point in ambient space, no matter where you fix it, you never see this old silicon mm -hmm. because it moves too fast. Yes. Um, yeah. So the, if you fix the point, the only thing you can see would be a sphere or a cylinder if you have a positive mean curvature. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, let's uh, thank Simon again.